Hello, my name is Dr. Georgia Anderson, and I am a clinical social worker as well as a research scientist. Um, I have worked for nearly 20 years as a clinical oncology social worker um, in a level one trauma center, outpatient cancer clinic, um, and also doing palliative care consults in the outpatient space and inpatient consults, um, and eventually managed that palliative care service in our uh, health care system. And then went on to become a research scientist. So I earned a PhD and I now work as a, um, an assistant professor at the University of Cincinnati in the College of Allied Health Sciences in the School of Social Work. Um, so throughout my clinical career, um, I really developed a lot of um, experience and skills in helping people prepare for end of life, um, which is an arena of practice that I never would have anticipated um, going into that space, I had never seen someone die prior to working in the hospital. Uh, my family was very hush-hush when my um, elder relatives became ill and didn't really talk uh, much about what was happening. And at the funerals, we certainly didn't talk about um, the cancer that had taken our loved ones or how that, you know, how that was managed. So death was very scary to me. Um, but then in, through my work, I really began to realize that death really is inevitable for everyone, even though none of us like to think about it. I used to facilitate support groups and I had one of my patients say the most profound thing. He said, well, if we think about it, we're all terminal. Everybody's terminal. Um, so we sort of in that support group developed the analogy. It's like if, if you've seen The Wizard of Oz and the Wicked Witch has Dorothy trapped up in the tower and she pulls out this giant hourglass and she flips it over and she says, when the sand runs out, your friends can't save you, <laughs> whatever. But when you get a cancer diagnosis, it's like the Wicked Witch has flipped that hourglass in front of you. So you become acutely aware that you might die with your cancer and not of your cancer 40 years from now, but it's still in the back of your mind that I have something going on in my body that could take me before I'm ready, which are any of us really ready? I don't know. That's a whole discussion for another day. But there are some things that we know from um, lots of research has been done on this, but as well, just my clinical practice, avoiding the topic and not talking about it is not going to make it e any easier when it happens. So I always couch all of these conversations with, even if you aren't ready to think about your death, I guarantee you, your loved ones are worried about it. And being okay with talking about what might happen eventually, or with death, we know it is going to happen to all of us. Um, but having a conversation about what, and I hate saying your wishes, that feels weird to me. Like, I wish for an all-inclusive vacation to Jamaica. I wish to sing a duet with Harry Connick Jr. I don't really know that making my wishes known for end of life, that feels weird to me to use that terminology, but that's sort of the, the vernacular. So we'll talk about that. I think it's important to do advanced directives. And so people might say, what is that? Or don't I need an attorney to do that? That those are really what we call our healthcare powers of attorney and living will. Now those documents look different from state to state and the rules governing those are different from state to state. But essentially what that is, is designating someone as your proxy. So what do I mean by that? That means I'm going to designate someone to speak, to be my voice when I am unable to speak for myself. Having these discussions ahead of time means they don't have to have, they don't have to make the decisions because you've already told them what you want. So there's no guesswork. That is the number one gift you can give your loved ones. And it's a hard conversation, but it helps take away when you're emotionally charged and things are not going the way you wanted, it, it eliminates that extra layer of worry of, am I going to do right by this person that I love? Um, I always use the example, um, my father had leukemia that developed from myodysplastic syndrome. Um, he was a Vietnam veteran who was exposed to Agent Orange. And so he had this myodysplastic syndrome for years. Um, and even before we knew that he had that, um, we used to like to go on motorcycle rides. So I would be on the back of his bike and we would listen to Elvis, you know, we're out driving. And so he didn't have to look at me. 
Um, and so when I started working in palliative care, I would tell him about my work. And so when we were on motorcycle rides, he would tell me what he wanted. He could never have that discussion with me across the kitchen table while looking at me. But on those bike rides, he could tell me, I, I don't want to die in the hospital. You know, I'm an outdoorsman. I want to be in my own house or I want to be able to see nature. I do not want to be in a hospital. I don't want a bunch of machines keeping me alive when it's my time to go. Let me go. And that was such a gift when that time came for him. Um, you know, it was in Florida during the pandemic. So we had limited hospice support um, because of the pandemic. So really until the, his last day, you know, we had to manage things with phone support, but it was different than having somebody there. But it made it easier to help navigate that time because I knew that he wouldn't be mad at me for not calling the squad to send him to the hospital because I knew he, he wanted, he lived on a lake. He wanted to have his hospital bed facing the lake, seeing the water instead of a hospital bed. So those conversations were hard. Those are hard conversations. And with patients, those have been hard conversations. I've had, you know, young patients in their thirties, you know, that had young kids, you know, that were buying birthday cards to be sent every year when they were gone. Those are hard things to think about. But like anything else that's scary, and I think about when we're little kids and we're sure that there's a monster under the bed, we're sure. But when you get the flashlight and you look under the bed, you know, you're, you're peeking for it. It's less scary, right? So we have, by talking about these things, it shines the light on it. And so, yes, it still can be scary. Um, it's hard. It's emotional. But I think that is the number one gift that you can do for yourself and for your loved ones. I would encourage you to think about these sort of topics of what is going to give you peace of mind while you are alive. And what will give your loved ones peace of mind so that when you are gone, they don't ever wake up and say, damn it, I wish I would have done something different. That is really my number one advice for end of life care. So your advanced directives, yes, it's a document, but it's really about the conversation. Um, yeah, Conversations of a Lifetime is a great um, website that you can go to that really helps you facilitate those conversations. Um, that is something your clinic social worker can help you with. Um, if there's a chaplain, oftentimes chaplains can help with that and it doesn't have to be a religious thing. Um, but I think it's important to know that it's not necessarily your funeral planning. All those, those sorts of things are important as well. And those are probably, I would say the conversation with your family just to demystify what everybody's thinking about. And then number two is the having your affairs in order, which that always feels really like doom and gloom as well. But that's probably something all of us should do. Um, you know, making sure, you know, if you live with another person, if, if you're the one that pays the bills, do they know the, the password to log into the bank to pay the bills? You know, do they know where the water shut off is? If you're the one that always takes care of that kind of stuff, um, just sort of knowing those sorts of things. Um, and then as an eternal optimist, I always say that this is good advice for anybody, whether you have cancer or not, say what you need to say to people, you know, live every day, um, in a way that you are not afraid to tell people, I love you. I appreciate you. Thanks for making me laugh. Or that really hurt my feelings when you didn't bring me a coffee, when you came to my house drinking one or whatever, being in that honest space, um, Again, it leaves, it takes away all that what if, or I never knew this. Ask the questions, you know, hey, what's your best memory? You know, those are fun conversations to have no matter what. Um, and I think developing that practice makes it less scary when end of life is a consideration because that's something we've adopted as a practice in our relationships anyway. So yes, end of life discussions can be scary, but they are, there is always hope. It's always hopeful. Just what we hope for changes. So maybe we know we can't hope for 20 more years of life, but maybe we can hope that everybody that we love knows that we love them and we die peacefully and not in pain. Maybe that's what we hope for instead. Um, so that is my best advice. It is certainly not gospel, but in all of my years of discussions, those are the things that I see over and over again, regardless of race, religion, socioeconomic status at the end of the day. 
people want to feel connected to the people that they love and they want to be able to talk about and they want to say, I'm afraid of dying or I'm relieved. I'm ready to die because I feel awful or I'm tired or I'm just ready. And being able to say that um, without judgment from their loved ones is the best gift that you can give to each other. Um, so I hope that advice helps. Um, and I will just always pray that you have peace when you are facing those decisions. So thank you.